responding curves uh, to dog three index front runners. My name is Billy. Uh, a little about me. I'm a developer relation engineer at Cosmos Network. I'm the founder and creator of Clover's Network. I've also done work previously with Aragon Black and Gnosis. I'm the author of the IP1633, the refundable token. Uh, the creator of ENS Nifty, which was a hackathon project that inspired ENS to make domain names and NFTs. Uh, and of course, the founder of uh, Meme Lords, the majestic uh, creation market for memes. Uh, today, I'll be talking about market makers, front running, uh, and going over uh, mitigation techniques that are following batch bonding curves. There's three different versions, and I'd be curious if uh, people have opinions about uh, which ones might make the most sense. Uh, some links, and then we can open up any questions if there are any again in a few time. So, um, bonding curves are automated market makers. You might be familiar with these concepts in the uh, context of uh, prediction markets. Um, a mechanism invented by Robin Hansen that's uh, used for basically gambling on future events. Uh, Bancor, uh, which uses a technique called the reserve ratio. Or Uniswap, which uses the constant product. Uh, created by Kyle uh, Fuderen and Alan Liu from Gnosis and implemented by uh, Hayden Adams. Uh, or the slow formula version of Bonnie Curves, which is uh, kind of spearheaded by Simon de la Rubia. Uh, but all these market makers provide liquidity, which is a very important concept in any sort of token based or asset based system. Uh, whenever you have uh, some asset that you're trying to sell or buy, and there's not a lot of other people out there trying to buy or sell it, you're going to have a lot of problems agreeing on a price uh, with means of low liquidity. And so uh, there's many situations in which you would have low liquidity, there's just not a lot of buyers, not a lot of sellers, it's a very niche topic or something like that. And so you have uh, designated parties who are willing to buy or sell at some predefined formula or agreement or system, and those are market makers. Uh, in a prediction market, you have this situation because the uh, tokens that you're dealing with are attached to outcome events. Um, this is the sort of gambling on future events, and often these are very illiquid markets because there's not a lot of participants, um, or there's not a lot of token circulation. So if, uh, say, the prediction market is about the future headquarters of Amazon, and uh, I think it's in New York, and you think it's in Chicago, uh, I, I maybe think it could be in Chicago, but you're like sure of it. So we, we don't really necessarily agree on what I should sell my Chicago tokens to you for. Um, so it might be nice to have something like a market maker who's willing to buy those back. Uh, the logarithmic scoring rule is the market maker used in prediction markets usually. And it's really nice because it's um, uh, calculated in a way so that at the end of all of these sort of events, uh, the tokens that did not occur, the prediction that did not occur, are deemed zero. And there's just enough money inside the contract to pay off all the people who had the tokens that did exist. Um, Microeconomies in general, uh, which could take place in app-specific tokens, like uh, token curated registries, or my project Clover's Network, uh, in which there's just you know a very niche uh, clientele for this this token, but uh, you don't want them to be sort of limited by that aspect. Probably you won't have access to exchanges. There's just not a lot of people buying and selling, and so there's very large spread. If some were to, there's no agreement about what the current price is. Uh, this is actually what got me into this topic to begin with, making my uh, Project Clover's network, it's a game, and uh, I didn't want my users to kind of be stuck with the shit coin and not be able to get rid of it, but there's no chance that some exchange is going to list me, so I wanted to be able to offer them the uh, ability to offload the coin for Ether, and so I was able to deploy my own bonding curve in the contract so users can constantly buy and sell at a price that's changing. Uh, but the general concept for uh, bonding curves, which have uh, indefinite token supplies, uh, are that the tokens themselves come from the contract, which is the market maker itself as well. So you could send some uh, collateral token, often Ether, into this contract, uh, and it will mint some new tokens for you. The price that it mints it at is designated from a predefined formula or an adjustable formula. Uh, in this situation, it would be basically total supply squared. See, the total supply is on the x-axis, so this sort of calculates how many tokens are currently in existence and that determines the price, which is on the y-axis. Um, but really, you, you can imagine when the, when the total supply is at the very beginning and there's almost zero, the price is very low. As you purchase, the price gets moved up. So let's say the first 10 that you buy will be less expensive than the next 10 after that, and the next 10 after that. 
Uh, if you wanted to get rid of those tokens, you can come back, send them to the contract, they will burn them, which will decrease the total supply, pushing the price back down. Um, and a really convenient aspect of this visualization is that the uh, area under the curve is actually the amount of collateral that's needed to populate that contract in order to generate those tokens. That collateral is always staying in that contract, which means that when you come back and try to cash out, that money's there waiting for you. So it's a bit like an ICO, except for the company doesn't have the money, the money's locked up, and it's there for buybacks. What is the RR? So that's, uh, right, so the top right there's some kind of math, and this is the two ways that are often used for thinking about these and calculating these, which is the price formula, kind of a basic slope formula, I think this is really useful for visualizing and designing these type of mechanisms. Uh, but when it actually comes to implementing, I kind of prefer uh, the way Bancor's done it, which uses the concept of the reserve ratio, so that's what the RR is. So they think about the price as the reserve, which is the amount of collateral, divided by the supply times some reserve ratio, which is going to be some number under one. Basically, what percentage of that uh, supply is actually backed by collateral? Um, which you can rearrange and see that the reserve ratio is actually the reserve divided by the market cap, so that's kind of like how much is actually backed. And the market cap, of course, is the price times the supply. So uh, those are the two sort of ways that I thought about. You can actually program it in the original format, but there's some nice properties of the reserve ratio that lets you do some sort of adjustments while it's moving. Um, I have some slides on that at the end we can go over, but it's not quite talk, part of the talk. Uh, the example use case that this uh, new batch bonding curve technique is being used in is in a continuous organization. Uh, and this is an idea where you would basically have a DAO that has a bonding curve attached to it. And when that money goes into the contract, it actually can be used by the DAO for operational costs or something like that. So the shares are the tokens, they're bought and sold this bonding curve. Um, and that locked collateral in some portion might be used for this working capital. And the token holders might receive something like shareholder rights or receive dividends as uh, being a participant inside of this, sort of more like a traditional company. Um, it's been implemented with Aragon Black called the Fundraising App, uh, which should be coming out soon. There's also some other organizations working around it. Uh, sea Org from Thibaut Fabra. It's really interesting uh, working to get these types of organizations classified as Reg C in America so that uh, people can participate in them without having uh, credit investor status. Uh, D Org is also building a similar uh, mechanism using the DAO stack framework for Gnosis' DX DAO, and Giveth and the Common Stack is working with something similar. Um, so the continuous organization, instead of uh, going through and paying out dividends, I mentioned this might be sort of a, a feature that you would want in a system like this, uh, there's a really convenient uh, workaround. Instead of sending out a bunch of transactions for all the several stakeholders to give them dividends, you can actually just put money back into the collateral pool. And this is sort of, uh, will increase the value of all the tokens that already exist. So if you're a stakeholder and having these tokens, by injecting collateral back into this contract, the value per token will increase for everybody. So it's sort of like paying everybody dividends with just one transaction instead of an individual one to each person. Um, because if the collateral increases but the token supply stays the same, you can imagine that the price will get boosted up in that, that previous graph. Similarly, when you remove collateral, um, this is uh, a way to basically decrease the value of the tokens uh, because you've got to spend money to make money, but uh, these are kind of the, the two actions that you'd expect in a continuous organization using a bonding curve like this. So front running. Um, as most people know, uh, Ethereum and a lot of public blockchains uh, are kind of slow in their, their process of approving <coughs> transactions and blocks. And for a moment, there's this mempool of not processed transactions. And so in that moment, you kind of have full sight of all of the other activities that people are taking place on the blockchain. And uh, if you can see that some of these transactions are buys or sells in one of these bonding curves, you'll know that there's going to be a price movement. And whenever there's a guaranteed price movement, front running is possible. In the act of front running, um, imagine a buy order is coming in you as a front runner would be able to make another buy order uh, and boost the gas price, which might make the uh, order get included first, depending on how the miner works, or you might be a miner yourself. Uh, you would make a buy order in front of them with the new gas, they would make one after you, and then you would make a sell one. So when you make your buy, the price is pushed up. They make their buy, the price is pushed even further up. You make your sell, and you're back down here. Um, so this is 
kind of bad because there's no risk in that, that buyer interacting with this market. And so they're basically just scraping off some of your money in the buyer. It'd be like going into a store, buying the object in front of somebody else, turning around and selling it to them at a markup when they could just buy from the store. Similarly, in a sell order, if you see a sell coming in, you can make a, a sell in front of them, push the price down. They can make a sell, push the price further down, and then you can buy back. So this is a way to increase your current position with no risk, sort of scraping off their money and using it for yourself. In those two dividend and working capital situations, you could similarly front run. Uh, so the uh, transaction that might inject collateral into the pool, this is similar to a buy because you know there's gonna be a guaranteed price moving up. So you might decide to buy right before that, the injection happens and then you sell right afterwards. Uh, or if the working capital is about to be removed, uh, you wouldn't wanna have a situation that you could just sell your tokens right before they withdraw that capital and then buy back afterwards um, in the same transaction. Uh, so front running in the wild is rather rampant. Uh, these are some statistics from last year's talk by Phil Dyan about it. Uh, so they were doing most of the work on sort of publishing this in the wild and uh, putting the, them in 2017 on Ether Delta alone, which was not a very popular exchange. There was $4,500 a day in August. Um, he and others recently released a paper called Flash Boys 2, which is a reference to Flash Boys, the high frequency traders who had sort of uh, built their own line of the internet across the uh, river New Jersey to the New York Stock Exchange in order to front run orders or do different types of activity like that. Um, and by their estimates, there's 30% of all blocks contain some kind of programmatic arbitration uh, transaction, which would be included in these sort of front running. Uh, if you want to see more data on that, you can go to frontrun.me. There's a, a lot of really good work to do in there. So uh, this, is, this is obviously rampant in the wild, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, and so we do need to address this because we can't really ask anybody to use an on-chain exchange if we know that it's not going to be able to deliver quality service. Uh, so, batch orders with common clearing prices is one proposed solution uh, with three versions here. Uh, calling them ordered batches, match and fill, and a common clearing price. Uh, and again, uh, they each have their sort of uh, benefits and drawbacks, and I'd be curious uh, with the general sort of feeling as what you thought the, the best version was. So the first one batched orders, I'm um, oh, sorry, well, they all sort of follow a similar idea, which is that you take some span of blocks and you collect all the buys and you collect all the sells in that span. And in order to make things a little bit easier, you just combine them into one big buy and one big sell, keeping track, of course, of all the individuals who actually put in those, those orders. Um, and then you clear them together with some price, uh, and then you redistribute it to those users based on that price and the percentage that they take. So the first version of that um, is, uh, has kind of a drawback in that one party gets rewarded over the other, although you can think of it as a feature, not a bug, if you want to reward one of the parties more than the other. For instance, uh, the buyers. Um, so in order batches, it kind of takes the most simplistic approach, which is why don't we just execute all of the buys using the bonnet curve and then execute all the sells, or the way around. Do all the sells and then execute all the buys. Uh, but this does reward one or the other. So imagine the execution buys first. So let's say we're starting out in the blue line. That's the current spot price. Uh, if we execute the buys first, the price moves up to the red. This is really good for the sellers because they want to sell at a high price. Uh, and so they've now sort of been given this, this prized position of having a high sell price, which then moves the price back down. Uh, overall, if you were to execute the same orders buy first and sell first, the final price would be lower when you do execute the buys first. Uh, if you were to execute the sell first, you can imagine starting this blue line again. It's going to push it down to where the green is, which is great for buyers. They want to buy at low prices. Uh, so now they're sort of the privileged party in this situation. Uh, the final price is going to be higher than average, uh, or higher than the sell version, uh, which are the two sort of features. But if you want to reward buyers in your system, you kind of think they're putting money into the system, they're, they're you know, contributing. I want to make sure that they're rewarded for this capacity. You might say this is a feature, and you want to make sure it happens this way. Maybe you have an idea of rewarding sellers, you can do the other one. So the second method is called match and fill, and I think of a hat tip for uh, Martin Goldman from Gnosis for helping me with this. Um, and this idea is that you have that, that original spot price, the current one, and of course, with the body curve, as soon as you start buying or selling, it'll start moving it, but in that moment, you have an exact price, a theoretical exact price. So why don't you take that one and match orders as much as possible? You've got this big group of buys, you've got this big group of sells, at that spot price, one half of them is going to get completely consumed by the other half. 
You're going to have some leftover buys if there was actually more buy orders. You're going to have some leftover sells if there were actually more sell orders. So whatever's left over execute with a normal bonding curve transaction. So you have this entire side that gets taken care of just at the spot price, disappears. The other side gets a combination of that spot price plus whatever was left over as this bonding curve. The third one is the common clearing price. This is kind of the, the, what you would imagine is the goal. Uh, and this is where you can find some fair price for the entire group of buys and sells. Uh, however, it's a little bit too complicated to calculate on the EVM. Another hat tip to Gnosis member uh, Tom Walter for helping me with this. Uh, but you can see the formula for uh, getting this is, is rather hard to find. It is possible. It, it ends up resulting in uh, one solution that's uh, zero, one imaginary number solution, and then one correct solution. Uh, what is convenient is that even though it's hard to find, you wouldn't be able to calculate it on the EVM, it is easy to verify on the EVM. So if you were to take that price, which was the correct price in that formula, provide it with the transaction, execute the orders, you'd be able to check, did this mess up the slope at all? Did this change the market maker? Because if it was an incorrect price, it would have modified that. So it's easy to verify. So there is a solution for it with that. This is inspired by the Gnosis Diffusion Exchange, which does something similar, very, very complicated executions, but it's easy to verify that they were done correctly off-chain. Um, in a similar topic, Uniswap has been working with batching orders. They're calling it netting trades. Uh, so that's from Dan Robinson and Hayden Adams. I just found out about this the other day. They might be talking about it later today at 420 in room B7. You can see that when you're using the constant product, it actually becomes much easier to make this batch order calculation. Um, Uniswap is a great product, and it's used specifically for, for tokens that already have sort of uh, fixed supplies or supplies that exist in the wild. Whereas I think that uh, body curves get much more interesting, much more useful when there's a situation that the token is actually generated from the same place as the market maker, or situations like prediction markets and curation markets. But if you don't have that requirement, then Uniswap is a, is a definitely like preferred calculation method, and it has this convenient uh, batch order system. So there's a link to the GitHub a proof of concept there. Uh, it also links to the Aragon Black implementation. It's still uh, undergoing final audits. Uh, and there's also a link to a medium article that has a bit more details about all these topics if you want to check that out again later. I'll wait until I see phones going down. Cool. And um, if this is interesting to you, come say hello, talk to me. Uh, get a hold of me on Twitter, email, GitHub. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, do we have any questions? We still have a few minutes. So the, the three approaches that you described, do you have a, a personal favorite and, and why? Yeah, so uh, for the most part, while working on this, I was really looking forward to this common clearing price, this, this universal one for everybody. Uh, but after sort of finishing it and finding it, I, I kind of started favoring the second one. And uh, because I think that it's sort of, uh, the price is it's more reflective of the way the market is actually acting. You know, like if there are more buyers than sellers, that buyer should handle the sort of price movement. Whereas the sellers are sort of the, the minority in that system in situation. So maybe they should actually just have the spot price, which is the preferable one. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the common claim price is also kind of a feels good. That's what I meant. Sort of, I'd be curious about your all's opinions. If one of those feels better or worse for you, I mean, of course, the first one also for the use case of rewarding the buyers makes sense. Um, but I, I skew towards the middle, a little bit the third. I don't know. If we maybe get a show of hands. Uh, first curve as the like best one for general use case. Anybody? Okay. Uh, second version. We got some hands. We got some hands. And third version. Okay. We got a couple. Uh, so I'd say general consensus is second. Kind of makes sense, but um, yeah. Question. In that second version you're talking about, for the group that's left, where there's leftover, either buyers or sellers, do you uh, distribute like the price slippage evenly between that entire group, or is it like a set of buyers get screwed or a set of sellers get screwed? Evenly between that entire group. Good talk. <laughs> um, so did you look at all at um, heuristics or optimizations for the uniform clearing price, or at, did you just implement? Um, so we found a, the, the formula that has all of the, the like necessary variables that you want to solve for. Um, but I ended up just using like Wolfram Alpha to like solve it. Uh, I know there's like some Python libraries that are good for that sort of symbolic subbing out. 
Uh, but when you actually solve it for the variable you actually want, it becomes this really nasty, nasty formula that uh, I don't know how to deal with. Uh, so I'm sure there are ways to optimize that math. Uh, but at the end of it, that's all sort of off-chain off data, so it doesn't necessarily need to be optimized. All that really matters is that it's easy to verify on-chain, which is easy enough. So what was the, um, you mentioned on uh, your last slide that because uh, Uniswap right, doesn't have uh, the same constraints uh, that, that you were looking at. Um, what is the, the, the kind of breakthrough there that prevents front running? Um, uh, it's, it's the same idea of, of batching the orders, um, and they choose the common clearing price, which is kind of the third version. Okay. So as the orders come in, they get calculated and cleared with the common price. Yeah, so it's not like they're doing anything new, they just have an easier time with the equation. Exactly, exactly, because the constant product formula is a lot easier to do than, than the other ones. Are there any common patterns with like the size of the orders that A, you know, tend to be the front runner orders versus the ones that tend to be front run? Like, does it tend to be small orders front running large orders, or is it just like kind of uniform across the board? Like uh, front running in the wild, you mean? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure about that. I would say check frontrun.me for that kind of data. Uh, but I, I don't know. I've talked to some people, and it seems like it's easy pickings, but there's actually just such little liquidity on chain that there's not, it's maybe not worth putting in the effort to front run everybody. I don't know. So I've looked for front runners. Um, the reality, I mean, I've had a lot of talks with different shops about it. Um, the, the short version is what you were saying. Um, there's just not enough money in it. Making $10,000 a day running a fairly complicated front running bot, um, even though $10,000 a day sounds like a lot, uh, people I talked to said it literally wasn't worth it. Um, so that's the issue. I mean, if we do actually get liquidity and people using DEXs, of course, that would probably be a different case. Well, I, I would assume that at some point there would be a product differentiation between the DEXs where you say, you know, no one's going to front run your fill, right? And that's, and so people would actually just fix the problem because it's, it's an entirely fixable problem in the DEX software itself that allows for the front running. Um, there's no, you know, strictly speaking. Well, I think we're at time. Uh, if you want to talk later, come back. Thanks a lot.